All right, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, a scientist I've admired for a very long time, Petra Levin from Wash U in St. Louis. Petra, we're excited to hear your story. Um, thank you, because I admire you too, Erin. So, and thank you, Shree, for inviting me to do this. Um, I realize I don't have a picture of me as a kid, but I will hopefully convey some of my background without that photo. Um, I want to say that I am third generation PhD. My dad is a biologist and my mother is a historian. And I grew up in a college town in Western Massachusetts called Amherst. And um, although the university was there, you're looking actually at a picture of UMass, which has the world's tallest library. Should you ever wonder what it's like? Not great, but there it is. Um, I spent a lot of time in the lab as a kid, mostly waiting for my father to be done. I spent, that was just where we waited and I hated it. And I swore I would never do science or be a biologist, or if I did, I'd never have my children wait. Um, and then uh, when I went to college, I, I kind of bucked the trend, which was to go to Michigan in my family. And I went to a small college also in Massachusetts, a little further west, a little further north um, called Williams College which is a small liberal arts college. It has about 2000 students. And I think we had maybe in my class, 15 biology majors, it was very small. And um, we did have a lot more students who took biology though. And mostly I went there because it was really beautiful and I knew I'd get a good education, but I mean, look at it, it's so beautiful. Um, and so I picked my college mostly because of aesthetics, but I was really lucky because I had fantastic teachers. Um, I had two teachers who really taught me to love biology in its own right. Um, one was Marsha Altschuler, who taught me, um, I would say, the language of biology. And she had this class where we could design our own experiments using fertilized eggs, which I don't even know if you can do anymore, but it was amazing. We could do our own experiments and just ask our own questions, which was so wonderful to be able to do. Um, and then I also had, happens. Uh, another professor whose uh, name is Chip Lovett, and he was actually my research advisor, but he also taught chemistry. And he taught me that science is really fun to really enjoy the process and that a failed experiment can teach you something important and really that a great teacher can make anything interesting. So again, these are teachers at a small liberal arts college. They had undergraduates doing research in their labs. Both of them published papers and had grants, but it was a very small scale, not at all like an R1 institution like where I'm at now or even like UMass. Um, and I fell in love with developmental biology while I was at Williams. I um, was really fascinated by this idea that you could go from an undifferentiated cell to a very complex adult organism. And at the time, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, to study that, you'd want to study it in a organism like uh, Xenopus lavis, which was huge and had these giant eggs and you could do a lot of things with them, but you couldn't do genetics. And I also love genetics. And so I wanted to combine the two of them. And so instead of studying Xenopus, I decided to study Bacillus subtilis, which also has a fascinating life cycle, but and it's very simple developmental system because it's still developmental biology. You go from one cell type to a differentiated cell that has one cell that becomes a resistant endospore and then another cell that's the mother cell that nurtures the spore and then actually at the end gives its life so that the spore can uh, hang out actually for up to millions of years, they think, um, until it can then germinate again. So it was a very simple system. And I was really enthralled with the system in part because I got to work in Rich Losick's lab at Harvard. And Rich is a force of nature. He, this is actually a YouTube video of Rich, which I totally think is worth watching to see somebody give a masterful talk. Um, but he just is so excited about science. Everything we did was exciting. And so we could ask questions. He let me look at things I wanted to, but he also was like, anything I did was exciting. And this was true for everybody in the lab. If we brought in a very simple experiment, like a, we did a, we cloned something and we showed it to him, he'd be excited because then we could do the next thing. And that was so awesome as a graduate student. Um, while there, I became really fascinated with how cells switch from dividing in the middle to dividing at one end to form this differentiated uh, spore over here. And to study that, I actually ended up falling in love with a protein. 
um, called FTSZ, and it's required in bacteria for division. And wild type cells divide really nicely in the middle, but if you have a mutation in FTSZ, and this is an essential protein, so this is a heat sensitive mutation, the cells get really long. And before I started grad school, right before it, um, Joe Lutkenhaus at, uh, at the University of Kansas Medical School in Kansas City had done these experiments where he showed this is E. coli and this is immunogold labeling that you could see FTSZ at where the septum was. And this immediately they made a model how this protein might work. It probably is forming a ring at the division septum. And you know, they didn't know exactly how, but helping the cell divide. And actually I went, when I was a first year grad student, I had a, my roommate was, college roommate was from Kansas City. And I visited Joe Luckenhouse and he was so kind because there I am like really a first year grad student. And he showed me these EMs before they were published. And it was so exciting. But what really made actually grad school work even better for me was there were two women in the lab, Liz Harry and Kit Pagliano, and they were postdocs. And until that time in the early 90s, nobody had done immunofluorescence in bacteria. People didn't even think bacteria had structure. And so these guys were like, oh, we can do that. And they basically used techniques, immunofluorescence that had been done in yeast, which aren't that much bigger. And they looked in bacteria and they could see in bacillus different proteins being turned on and localizing in the mother cell than they saw in the four spore. And it was like that scene from Wizard of Oz where you look and suddenly Dorothy sees Technicolor. That was what it was like. It was like seeing Technicolor. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, Liz Harry's paper and she's localizing a protein that's only turned on in the mother cell. And before this, we had to infer it or use immunogold labeling. And this is kits and this is a protein that surrounds the spore and you can see it here in yellow. We could actually see inside cells. These are taken from their first papers describing using these techniques from eukaryotes in bacteria. Um, so what I learned from that is that science is creative and science is fun and that I've tried to like keep that with me the whole time. It's like, it's so fun to just be able to ask questions like Marsha Altschuler told me and that it's fun and you can really do things. Um, so again, I fell in love with this protein FTSZ. It forms a ring at the division site. I wanted to understand how it works. So this is actually using immunofluorescence to look at FTSD in bacillus. And I wanted to know how is it involved in sporulation? And this is actually, it was so expensive to publish color in those days. We put all the images in one figure. <laughs> we got all the way to X and then had to start again. But this is some of the first images of FTSE being localized in bacillus. And we also did it for fun in E. coli. And we found that it, it forms two rings, one at each pole of a sporulating cell. And then one side is actually used and the other side is, is removed. So then it forms only one septum at one pole. And that was just super exciting. And it was so exciting, I couldn't stop working on it. And so one day, Alan Grossman, who was actually a postdoc of Rich's, who had his own lab at MIT, I started just walking the other way and I became a postdoc in Alan's lab. And Alan let me do also whatever I wanted, which was amazing that these guys let me do this. Um, and for fun in the lab, we were just sticking GFP on everything. I think Jennifer mentioned GFP was like new and we could just put it into bacillus on anything we wanted. And sometimes it didn't work and sometimes it did. And we put it on FTSZ and we could see FTSZ in the cell, which was what we expected. But the fact that it worked was really kind of surprising. Um, and then, but it wasn't actually wild type. The cells were actually pretty sick, but we could use it like a conditional mutant. The cells, it didn't work at high temperature, so we could look for things. So if you imagine this FTSC GFP didn't form rings at high temperature, if we knocked out an inhibitor, we would actually get the balance back. And doing this, we found a whole bunch of different genes that modulated FTSC assembly and made sure it formed in the right place at the right time all of that. And it was just, again, we were just messing around, putting GFP on things, and then we were looking at the cells. Um, so in Alan's lab, I really learned, don't be constrained. I started off working on one thing, how the switch to polar septation was made. And then I suddenly was working on regulation of FTSC generally. I learned different approaches. I did biochemistry. I learned to follow the science. And that was a huge thing, because it's like, I can really do what I want. Um, and then that, I finally left Massachusetts. I'd been there my whole life. And I came to St. Louis, um, to Washington University. 
And there I just also kept using it. And we were using this FTSC GFP and we actually identified a protein that made cells smaller. And this was a big surprise because we were expecting to find proteins in the wrong place, but not that maybe formed too easily and the cells divided. And this actually started us on this whole thing because this connected bacteria get bigger in carbon rich medium. And this was partly how they do it because when carbon's around this little protein inhibits FTSC assembly. So it makes it harder for the cells to divide. So they're longer when they divide. Just crazy things we learn. Um, and this also started me down the rabbit hole of metabolism, which I, when I first started looking at metabolism, I couldn't bear it. Alan would always say, oh, it's metabolism, just ignore it because it's so overwhelming. But actually there's a lot of really important and interesting stuff that happens. And we really started to try and pick apart what the signals are that modulate cell growth, cell cycle progression and antibiotic resistance that come from metabolism is a lot of what we do now. So I just want to say, like, from the beginning, my lab, you know, was very tiny and we've grown much bigger. Some of these are summer students, so not that big, but it's just been really an adventure. And it's really who's in the lab. And I really let them, I don't say you can do anything, but I usually give them a choice of projects and they get to decide where they want to go and what they want to do. And that way, the creativity keeps going because if it's only me, right? I'm a limited person. I can only think of certain things and I'm constrained by my experiences. So the more diversity we can get in the lab, the more diversity of thinking and background and approach, the more we can learn. So that's been great. And I mean, all the people, the people in the lab are really the lab, the students, the postdocs, techs, they're the lab. Um, I also want to thank all the collaborators. A lot of the stuff we do, we do a lot of work with physicists. We just had a paper with Sri and Kunal, in fact. I can't do that math. I'm trained as a molecular biologist, as a geneticist. So by bringing it together, you know, these different disciplines, we can really learn a lot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to really end by take home messages. I think the first one is ask interesting questions. If you're going to spend time on it, Wally Gilbert told us this when we were gr baby grad students, if you're going to spend time on something, you should ask an interesting question because you're going to spend the same amount of time as you would on a question that's not interesting to you. You should be prepared to use whatever tools you need. You can't say, I'm just a geneticist. I'm not gonna learn how to purify proteins or collaborate with somebody who can do that because you're not gonna get the full picture. You have to enjoy the small victories. I totally agree with Rich. Like you clone something, you should be really excited about it because you can't do the next thing till you do that. Um, you gotta go where the science goes. I'm a geneticist. Genetics, you get what you ask for, not necessarily what you want. Collaborate and make friends. So. I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Petra. That was fantastic in so many ways. And I see all the excitement that you saw in Rich. And every time you speak, I feel like you must have been kindreds in that way. Um, so there's a question for you from the chat. If you could magic wand and change a thing or two about how we do science as a community, what would that be? Wow. Um... I feel like there's a lot of things around the edges that I would change, but I think if there, there's not one thing, I think there's many things people mentioned, um, diversity and inclusion. I think I've been in places where people say things, you know, and it's clear that, you know, it's like, well, you're a woman, you're thinking about this a different way. Um, so, I mean, those are things I'd like to change, but I think, you know, there's this silly saying about we have to be the change. And I think really, I think the more people can really take responsibility and do the little things that they can, that's where we can actually push forward. Um, when I started, um, I thought my mom and her generation of women had solved this problem and everything was going to be fine. And there were 50-50 in my graduate class. And now I'm one of senior women in my department. And I think we're maybe 15, 20% senior women. And I don't know what happened, but clearly something is still not right. Um, and so I think we can't take our foot off the gas. That's, I guess, I don't know if that's a magic wand, but I think that's the only way we can continue to make a change because diversity is important because that's, again, where all these different ideas and ways of thinking come from. And if we all think the same way, we're never gonna move. Absolutely, thanks. I, I think we're out of time. Uh, Shri, is that right? Uh, okay. Yes, um, I'm closing the recording.